So the Proust questionnaire. Explain. Yeah. The Proust questionnaire, as I said, um, you know, it's going through sort of um, not remembrance of things past, but current value systems that inform your aesthetic about how you create the art you create. Okay. Okay. And that's the purpose of the questionnaire. And I they think. do this in the back of the New Yorker? No, it's Vanity what? Fair magazine Vanity does it, okay. but that they're just following a tradition that it was established a long time right. ago of people asking the, the, these questions okay. generally. Okay. Okay. So the first question is, you know, and all of these are, are geared toward being um, f relating to film and cinema. Right. So you then kind of re structured the right, questions exactly. for film. And so I preface everything by saying cinematically speaking. Okay? okay. And so the first question is cinematically speaking, what is your idea of perfect happiness? For this I thought about a specific time when I was half submerged in a river with mm -hmm. a camera shooting a scene and I've done that twice. And for some reason, that is my favorite, that is my idea of happiness, is being deep in a river, you know, which is intense, and this water's flowing, you know, I remember it was flowing, and I'm struggling to stay, you know, to keep my ground mm -hmm. while I get the shot. That's my idea. And you got the shot. And I got the shot okay, twice. So I've twice. done that twice. twice. And both times, I've never felt more happy than when I was doing that. So if I submerge you in water, now I'll give you a camera. Right, exactly. exactly. I can make you happy. I back. can make me very happy. Yes. Okay. So that's good. Okay. What is, cinematically speaking, what is your idea? Of okay. Happiness? Uh, I wrote these down. Okay. And so I'll be referring to it. And the reason I wrote it down is I didn't want to give facetious answers. Okay. Yeah, and I want to give, I, I really wanted to think seriously about right. it. Right. And stuff. And I, I say here, waking up with nothing to do all day, but look at movies talk about movies, and then thinking about how to realize one of my many ideas on film. Awesome. You see? And in a way, what I'm talking about, and I, I used to say it in class, um, I said, I'd like to die like Orson Welles. He was at his table working out a film project, and he kind of slumped over, and that was it. Right. Yes. <laughs> and that's perfect happiness. That is perfect happiness. <laughs> I'd like to die on set in yeah. a river. In a river. Holding a oh. camera. Oh. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I was just at it. All right. So, next question. Okay. Your turn. Okay. What is your greatest fear, cinematically speaking? Cinematically speaking. I thought about this, and it's just somehow not being able to make movies anymore uh -huh. some being somehow prevented I, I thought it sounds crazy but being committed like mm -hmm. putting in being put into some kind of hospital sure. or I asylum really where i could not continue i couldn't get my hands on a camera i couldn't somehow continue making movies um or being handicapped to the point where i couldn't do yeah. it blinded or mm -hmm. that's just that's that's my greatest fear and even blinded you in some way. I could find a way. I could do yes. it. Yes. Blinded yes. would not stop me. Yeah. Being committed, I would make them in my head yeah. until I yes. escaped. Because John Ford actually had one eye. Right, yes. exactly. And uh, actually that helped him because film is a two-dimensional medium. Right. And so he was seeing two dimensions. Yes, yeah. this is okay. true. And so what my, is your greatest fear? Okay, my, cinematically speaking, I, I was saying, and I'm talking philosophically, right. in a way, is that the money people will so take over the mainstream movie-making process uh, that the rebels, the mavericks, and the individualist filmmakers will be squeezed out. Okay. And that, to me, because um, I see it constantly. And it's not just that the money people do it deliberately, but the audience, for the, for the most part, the majority, uh, cling to those kind of pictures. And subsequently, you know... Um, it'll squeeze out a good number of them. I don't think you can ever, ever really discover right. discourage you somebody who really wants to. Not at all. But it's they may be happen. pushed to the very, very fringes. Right. Yes, and that's, that's what bothers me. Right. Okay. I agree. Okay, I'll ask you the next sure. question. We'll bounce back and forth a little more. What, cinematically speaking, what historical movie personality do you most identify with? Oh, for me, that was an easy one. Okay. Austin Wells. Okay. And I said, because against all odds... He, is always, he was always trying to do something different and original. Beyond that, and the thing I love the most for, is he maintained a sense of humor. Uh, 
in the face of multiple reversals right to the end of his life right you know and i think a sense of humor in life wasn't bitter. is the most important thing no not at all he found it a great big joke right all the time like that you know and if you see an interview with him he'd, he'd tell you yeah and he laugh you know about the irony of the fact that for instance a touch of evil after winning the Cannes film award was cut chopped up and released as a second feature in the united states right yeah you know? And he had a major star. He had he Jonathan Heston. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll ask you the question. Okay. Okay. And this is a question that is similar to a question later on. Well, we got it. Yeah. I got to do the historical movie. Oh, oh yeah, that's too. Right. Yes. Mine would be. I, I don't. It's hard for me. Mine would be Hawks. Howard okay, Hawks. Howard Hawks. Not because of who he was necessarily, but mm-hmm. because of the professional ethic. His his. Making films about professionalism mm-hmm. and his idea of professionalism that you you do this, you you, you do your best, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And you're always striving to just go and do the job. And when I see his films, it's more than just films. The the characters in his movies become the way that I want to work, the standard that I want my crews to work at, mm-hmm. that I want my actors to work at. So his his movies have become almost my philosophy for life. Uh-huh. So it, for, as a historical, as a as a dead director, yes. for me, his the way he established that is, is what I admire the most. Because one of the questions um, characters in his films often ask right. is, "Are you good enough? Are you good enough?" Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and philosophically, that's the question. Right. Are you good enough to match the best out right. there? Are you good enough? To warrant the faith right. placed in you right. be, do, to do the job. Yeah. Right. No, I see that. Okay. Which living filmmaker do you most admire? Okay, I. I know <laughs> okay. what you're going to say. Yes, Jean Luc Godard. <laughs> okay. And I said, because with his work, he, was, he is always challenging uh, our conventional ideas of what film is all about. Simple as that. Yeah, no. Nobody else I know pushes me to the wall intellectually, aesthetically, uh, emotionally right. um, than Jean-Luc Godard. Uh, it challenges every time he comes out and every time I think I know what he's all about, Right. he breaks new ground. And he's still doing it. Yes, just, I time. haven't seen it, but he just released a movie. And they said I know. he may have made the best three D movie ever. But also, right? and he's uh, the most pushed, daring, right? Yes. and he's still confounding people. <laughs> yes, and, and he people, did it with what telephone um, right. cameras and stuff yes. like that. Yeah, <laughs> and made a musical too, and saw it through the eyes of a dog. Right. Yes. <laughs> you gotta. I have to love this man. I do. Yes. I do too. So now I put the question to you. Cinematically speaking, which living filmmaker do you most admire? You know who I'm going to say. Yes. Werner Herzog. Yes. Or Werner Herzog. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's just constantly, his, uh, his ethic and his philosophy and uh, his ideas of just uh, making movies and pushing forward and never mm-hmm. giving up and realizing he has these dreams, these images in his head, and he's on a constant war path. Mm-hmm. To make them happen, no matter what, no matter what odds he comes up against. I'm reading his diary from when he made Fitzcarraldo, uh-huh. and it's a great reminder that it's like no matter what I've faced film wise, struggling with actors or struggling with getting funding, this guy has has faced more than I think anyone. You know, mm-hmm. he's been deep in the heart of the Amazon jungle. You know what I mean? Yes. Tangling with with you know, uh, governments, armies. You know, uh, native Indian tribes, the, the craziest actor that ever lived, Klaus Kinski, <laughs> right? You know, pulling a boat up a mountain, and that's just one film he's made. Yeah. And he's he's been thrown in prison in Africa. He's wow. he's been on a volcano that was about to blow up. That everybody said this thing's gonna blow up and you're gonna die. And he's like, I'm gonna sit here with my camera and I'm gonna film it. <laughs> and then of course it didn't. But the point is, he continues to push himself and push the medium. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To new levels. I really think he's one of the only people, other than Godard, yeah. that's really continuing that. to yeah. push it. And uh, he said, I read a quote from uh, from that book that I'm, I'm talking about that I thought was really interesting and that I relate to. And I, I'll uh, abbreviate it. I'll make it smaller. Is He, he said, I realized that uh, suddenly that I was all alone. That, that everyone around, I was surrounded by hundreds of Indian extras, forest workers, crew members, actors, all of this. And in this moment, I realized I'm 
totally that solitude flailed at me like a an enraged animal is what he said but then the last part of his quote is the most important he said but i saw something that others did not see which and that's him no matter what all alone he forges ahead so anyway that's okay. a long-winded answer. But, no, no, but, but no, no. It's a he's my answer. guy. Okay. What is the trait you most deplore in yourself? Well, there's a whole lot. <laughs> but uh, I thought about, thought about this, and I thought, um, particularly when I was younger, um, I said, listening to so many people telling me that I couldn't, telling me what I couldn't do, when I know in my heart that I could. Okay. Because... And I, I see that I tried as a stu- as a teacher never to do that with students mm-hmm. to discourage anyone. Right. But there seems to be people who really feel for some reason that they know everything. And so when you're young, and that's when you're most vulnerable to that because you look to older people assuming they know what's going on. This is true. Um, the minute you s- make a statement yeah. that is outside of their frame of reference. More often than not, they tell you you can't. Right. You see. And so that's my biggest regret, was listening to that. And so I say that to advise anybody young not to listen Don't to listen that to kind them. of thing. If you want to do because it. Because they'll tell you, you, yes. you can't do it, you can't do this. And you, when you know in your heart you can, just forge forward. It's just what you were saying about... Um, whiplash. Not whiplash, but the director, Werner Herzog. Right. Yeah. You know, how many times was he told oh, he can't? Constantly. You know? I mean, every day. Every right. time he comes right. up with a project, yeah. they tell him he can't. You can't do and that. he moves forward. Right. Yes, sir. Like that. So, now, you. I took this in a more personal way, mm-hmm. thinking about my personality traits. Sure. You know, and what... And, and I, I thought that my my main... The main thing that I that I deplore in myself is is anger and my and my struggle with anger and my bitterness and, and mm-hmm. anger towards people that I'm working with mm-hmm. and it, it, having hurts um uh, not hurts uh, Wells mm-hmm. would be a good model for me to study <laughs> in the sense of just just laugh about it mm-hmm. don't take it so goddamn seriously you know what I mean yeah. just yeah. just if if someone's being a total asshole just laugh it off. And move on, you know. But I, I struggle with really getting worked mm-hmm. up about it. So that's mm-hmm. the part. I don't know if that answers the question sure. correctly. I think so. But for yeah. me, I, I see my answer. Well, I thought of personal things, but I didn't want to reveal that much about myself. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I made it. That so makes sense. Yeah, that yes, makes sense. But your right answer that. was really good. I like um, it. Okay. The next question is, and I'll ask you first, uh, is what is your greatest extravagance? Well, we missed uh, what is the trait you most deplore in oh. others, oh, which I'm is sorry. probably my yeah. favorite question oh, okay. on the whole list because I, right, let's, let's I love talking about other people's <laughs> faults. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so the trait I most deplore in others is laziness or more specifically a lack of passion, apathy. Mm. Right. Okay. And you? Uh, mine, what did I say here? I said people who overstate their own or, other, or the achievement of others. Yeah, no. I'm constantly, oh, this is great. So-and-so is great. I've even had my people right. introduce me as, Gus is a great playwright. But, you know, d- you, I don't know. You feel embarrassed. Um, yes, I know. And, um, you know, time tells you that. Right. But to overstate, we live where people live by, by superlatives, you know. And I, it just, to me, undermines the value of anything. Right. Because it's overstated. Right. And so that's what I say I deplore. That makes sense. So what is your greatest extravagance? Okay, <laughs> it's simple enough. I say my attempt to collect every worthwhile title from the Criterion Collection. I just okay. was looking again, they're selling them 50% off. Right. And I thought, I got to go over there like a crazy man going after drugs. I want to go see what new titles I can collect. Right. I'll never be able to because I can't afford them, but it is an extravagance. I guess... I had a hard time thinking about this question and knowing really how to answer. Mm-hmm. I was thinking more, what is my greatest extravagance on set? Okay, sure. Right? Yeah. And and it's, I don't know if extravagance... And it's more appropriate for you to answer those questions right. because you are constantly making films. Right. I'm not. And that's... Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, even though you're writing and talking mm-hmm. and thinking about them uh, more than anyone I know. But... Uh, the in in it by extravagance I kind of maybe made this more indulgence. Mm-hmm. Yes. But oh sure. And I think it's for me legit too. and it's a it's kind of a silly answer, but long take 
two shots oh, really? <laughs> of my okay. extravagance in the sense that I do them mm-hmm. even maybe when I shouldn't because I want to and it's my indulgence. I okay. like them uh-huh. and I will insist upon them. Uh-huh. And like John Ford with his river shot in, yeah. in Two Road Together, oftentimes I'll say, that's it. That's what I want. I want to do this two shot ten times instead of getting any other coverage because I like them. You know, okay. So I'll do have eight minute long two shots. But as I said, the difference in the way we answer the questions are very legitimate right. because, as right. I said, you are actively making film after film after film. Right. And for me, I occasionally do, but um, my point of view is more philosophical. That makes sense. It's an overview. Right. Okay. What do you consider the most overrated virtue in cinema? Okay. And again, for me, I said big budget in Hollywood industry. Okay, I said they tend to throw money after every problem in place of creatively challenging themselves to solve the problem. And that makes sense. That to me is the biggest um, overrated virtue because I'm always hearing, "Do you know this film?" I mean, they they spout it in the me in the popular press and also in the trade press. A hundred million spent, two hundred million dollars spent. I really don't care. I want to know, is it a good movie or is, or is it, it a bad movie? Right, exactly. That's all. It doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter. This is a hard one, and uh, I'm going to alter the question a little bit. Okay, sure. Okay. Uh, what did you consider the most a- overrated attribute in cinema? Okay. Not necessarily virtue. I don't know if it's a virtue, mm-hmm. but aspect yeah. okay. or attribute of. And I'm going to say dialogue. And I know that mm-hmm. that's a, an odd answer, but... Though I love dialogue and, and the art of dialogue, as you do, mm-hmm. and, and, and movies that, that really show that, like His Girl Friday and the Hawks mm-hmm. Pictures, I really think it is one of the most, is the most overrated element of film, and that the directors I admire most, Herzog, Kubrick, Bresson, mm-hmm. really trying to divorce themselves of the theatrical idea of dialogue in film. Mm-hmm. So and I, And I think that people pushing the medium should continue to do so. No, I I agree with you because more often than not, dialogue is used as a crutch uh, to get by a whole series of things um, that can be resolved cinematically or visually. Yes, yes. I mean, again, I just saw a quote about John Ford. Somebody was talking about John Ford and saying, you know, he really hated words. And I posted I that, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's he hated right. yeah. the written word. He would tear pages out. James Stewart he would said that. sentences yes. to phrases and phrases to words. He would right. cut them yes. down yes. as yes. much yes. as he yes. could. Yes. Like that. Okay. Well, yeah, and then the, the two, I was hearing that, you know, Aaron Sorkin talking mm-hmm. about this new Steve Jobs movie, which I'm already as bored as can be hearing about, and the film hasn't even started to be made. And the comment was something, I've packed so many words into 180 pages, and I said... I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> leave your words on the page. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, with the, the question of... Well, see, there was a question on which, here. Y- yeah, which is which living director do you most admire? That's the one that's similar to filmmaker. Right. right. Now, what... Uh, for me, the distinction between them is... Because my answer to that, I'll go first, is Werner Herzog. Okay. okay? okay. Like okay. that... Because as he is, I think of him as a director, he's a director for hire sometimes when he wants to be, and his whole consciousness comes out of that, okay? okay? Whereas with Godard, Godard is even, I mean, you could say they're almost interchangeable, but they're not in the sense that Godard um, even comes up with equipment. You see what I'm saying? And Godard is sitting there and he's coming up with uh, political ideas uh, true cinema. Okay. He's doing a whole different thing than Herzog. And so my answer was um, Herzog, and I said because he's a committed filmmaker uh, who does it all the time without complaint or right. whining about lack of opportunity, money, or resources. That was my response yeah. to that. He's more, he's, he's a true craftsman yes. in the sense that he's, he's he, he, I think he would even compare himself to a blacksmith Right. Or carpenter, yes. just exactly. constantly yes. working. And so to me, that was the distinction between the two. Okay, I Question. didn't understand the distinction, but in the moment when you're saying yeah. that, I'm going to say something. I, I, I'm going to pick Spielberg, and okay. this is the reason why. Even though I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of his work at mm-hmm. all times, to me, of all the living directors, especially from that generation, 
he has been the most honest and consistent with what he set out to do, and and he stayed the path. He wanted to be a Hollywood studio director. He's probably the best Hollywood right. studio director, right. Right. and he's right. never he's never been dishonest about mm-hmm. what he wanted, or, you know, or or the, the his films have never. I don't know how to say this, falter from the path. They've never mm-hmm. strayed right. from yes. the path. Right. Whereas some of these other guys set out to be mavericks mm-hmm. and became conventional. He's always been conventional. Yes, right. And I admire his consistency. And he's pushed it, though. And he's yeah. taken it to great heights. Right. You know, I mean, I, I accept that and I fully, fully admire his work. You know. Okay. As a filmmaker, what is your greatest regret? Okay, I say here that I didn't pursue it as a profession more assiduously when I was younger and had the energy and a greater sense of daring than I do now. Okay. <laughs> because, you know, when I was young, I went to film school. Right. And uh, the thing that I probably had the hardest time with is raising money. I had scripts, and, um, but, you know, it wasn't as accessible as it is now, the right. equipment, etc. Uh, to make a 10-minute film would right. cost you $10,000 and there was 16 even, millimeter. You couldn't even do stuff like Kickstarter. No, you not at all. Put it no, out there there was say, nothing hey. at all. Yeah. And But if I really was truly committed, I would have stayed the course. Right. Yeah, no, so that's my greatest regret. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I'll qualify this. Sure. Uh, to me, films, the films that I've made are really... Mostly what they are to me is memories of making them, mm-hmm. right? I cannot divorce the film from what it was like to make it. Mm-hmm. Therefore, my greatest regrets are, however good the film was, the awful times that I've had sometimes <laughs> making them working with assholes, right? Okay. Yes. You know? And I cannot watch those movies and and enjoy them because... It actually sometimes hurts to watch them. So, if that makes any sense. Oh, no, it makes a lot of sense because Sidney Pollack said exactly the same thing about Tootsie. Uh, He didn't call Hoffman names, but he said, you know, right up to the end, he said, the only thing I want in life is to get back the time I spent arguing with Dustin Hoffman and Tootsie. He even said they had a very good sequel script that they could do. And he refused to do it because he did not want to put himself through, put that. Him through, himself through that, as right. you say. And Tootsie was one of the highest grossing films he made. So the lure to, re, to do a sequel was great. Right. But he did not want to have to go through that. And you're not the only filmmaker who said that. I've read others, I mean, of the name directors who will say, you know, what I remember best was the company of people that I worked with and right. whether it was difficult or, or pleasurable. Yes. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. Um, when are you happiest, cinematically speaking? Okay. I said, when I go- see a good movie made by anyone. That's a good okay. answer. I it's, like that answer. It's simple as that. When I see a good movie made by anyone, you know, uh, whether it's my favorite director or my least favorite director, right. I'm Thrilled. Someone surprises yes, you. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's how I felt. We both recently saw Whiplash. When yes. I walked out of Whiplash, I mm-hmm. wanted to dance like Gene Kelly and sing right. in the ring. Yes, yeah, that's, that's that how feeling. I felt. Yes. You know, I just thought this is when cinema's at its best, and I feel so good after watching it. Well, you know, curiously, you mentioned Gene Kelly because, you know, I thought of him while I was watching the picture. And I saw the film only yesterday. Yeah. And the reason I did is because in Debbie Reynolds' biography, she talks, she says the two hardest things she ever did, and they're also the two most things she's most grateful for, was having her kids first, and the second was making Singing in the Rain because Gene Kelly pushed her to the point where her feet bled right. when she danced. She said she did close to 800 hours of tapping wow. to prepare for that picture. And I thought of that him when I was watching the film. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. My uh, one of my happiest is behind the camera in the physical. Uh-huh. What I would say is, uh, what I like most about filmmaking is when it's the most physical. Mm-hmm. When we're on set, especially when we're not even in, a, in inside. When we're outside, when we're in some kind of rocky terrain, mm-hmm. or in the bushes, or so there's some physical element. When I'm next to the cameraman. And we're we're making it. We're maybe we're moving together. 
and he's doing a handheld shot. That's mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. that's when you ask you to show it. Yeah. So. Okay. Now I'll ask you a question. Okay. Which single filmmaking talent? I put it the extra word in. That, right. Do you most admire? And that would be by talent we mean an actor. Huh? An actor or, or a writer or, or a anything. writer or a cinematographer or you know any of the separate creative right. parts or technical parts uh, that go into the filmmaking process. I'm going to say uh, Nicolas Cage, who, as you know, is my favorite actor. The reason I'm going to say... But the talent, not the individual. We're saying, oh, oh, you yeah. mean the type of talent, whether it's acting, acting, or if it's editing, or if it's... Oh, so you said like producing, then. Producing. Producing. Okay. Tell Without me a why. doubt, because it's the hardest job. Okay. And I think that people don't it's it, people don't understand what it means mm-hmm. like most people when they a film one's best picture they wonder why it's the producers getting up to right. get the award and not the director well that's because they don't understand the filmmaking process <laughs> organizing this damn film from beginning <laughs> to end is the hardest job you know and um i am even though i'm a director and mostly a director i'm actually more proud oftentimes of my producing work mm-hmm. um, than I am of, of, of the directing work. Um, and the, yeah, for people who don't realize it, the producer really creates the entire mess and scene, really. Okay. And I used to talk about that in class because, again, I echo what you said uh, that I've always felt producing was the hardest job in cinema. And, um, and I would explain that. You know, you put three different producers and you give them the same cast, the same script, the same budget, they're going to make three different movies. Right. You know, and I can tell, for instance, to, uh, even with producers today, like Brian Glazier, when he works with Spike Lee, Spike Lee's film looks different right. than when Spike Lee makes a film where Spike Lee produces it. Right. You know, and so the signature of the producer is absolutely there. And I'm glad you said that because I still think, much as they are hated on one level, Producers um, are totally underappreciated. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah as the, a very important, maybe the most important part of the cinematic process. Right. What okay. is yours? What is mine? The I said probably movies? editing, and I okay. said probably, and I said because I believe it is truly when the idea of a film is realized. Okay. You see, the I mean, final it, final writing stage, right. really. Yes. Well, because you know you can shoot. All the footage, the script is written, the actors do this terrific job. But if it's not put together right, it doesn't work. Yeah. You know. We've seen um, that. Yes. Yeah. Well. And what's his name? Um, Sidney Lamette, I think, put it best in his book when he said that it is a technical job with creative overtones. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a very nice way of explaining what goes on for, uh, in the editing process. That's interesting. Um, what is your current state of mind? Okay, and I thought about that a lot. <laughs> and I said, happiness. And I'll tell you why. I said, because for the first time in my life, one, I can concentrate, dream about the thing, and dream about the thing that I love most. Watching films, talking about films, planning movie scenarios, and sometimes making films. Right. Okay. I mean, it's simple. Because the, for the rest of my time before I retired, I had other problems. I had to worry about teaching. I had to worry about other jobs. I had other things. Now I could totally concentrate on film. I can show myself five films at night because I have to prepare and wake up to go somewhere tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. So that to me That's good. is a state of bliss. <laughs> I like that. I'm, glad, I'm glad you feel that way. Mine is the total opposite. Okay. The current state of mind, uneasiness mm-hmm. is okay. what I said. Okay. Because, and I'll explain, because if happiness to me would probably be shooting six days a week and resting one. Okay. Right? You know, mm-hmm. on that day off, I would read, hang out with a girl, do whatever, watch a couple films. But I would really like to do what John Ford said, wake up really early in the morning, shoot all day. And be so exhausted at the end of the day, you fall in bed, you're done, right? That's what he, how he described westerns, right? You know, and uh, so when I'm in this state right now, mm-hmm. where I'm waiting to make a film, I'm working on funding, I'm working on pre-production, and all of this kind of stuff, mm-hmm. and things seem, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? Am I going to have to do a different project? That to me is a state of uneasiness. Mm-hmm. I'm not relaxed. So, 
Well, you realize what you also just said, you know, on the seventh day he rested. Right. I mean, so it's a biblical it is. <laughs> thing that you are approaching, which it's if true. we go out, go into it, uh, extrapolate it and go into it in a different way, um, God. Right. The director as the God. The director is okay. God. Or the producer is God. Yeah, the producer is God. Okay. What is your favorite part of the filmmaking process? Okay, for me, I said here, getting the cast and crew together and collaborating with them on a project. It is a collaborative medium, and it, the fun is combining your talent with theirs. That's good. For me, it's just simply directing on set. I don't. Uh -huh. I, I that is being in that moment on set, working with the actors, working with the cameramen, and getting it done and, and seeing it done. That's that's what I like the most. So okay, good. Um, thus far, what do you consider your greatest achievement, cinematically speaking? I yes. Um, I expanded that question because I don't make movies enough. And I said here, really, um, I, I, it took a lot of thought process from me for, to think about this one. I said here, completing, completing two full-time careers and fully enjoying them. One was playwriting, the other was teaching, right. and hopefully I am embarked on a third, filmmaking. Awesome. Yes, sir. I love and that. For me, those were the two, because I really truly enjoyed being a playwright, right. and I still am, yeah. but, and I loved teaching. I mean, teaching was my great, great pleasure. I stumbled into it accidentally, right. and uh, I'm so glad I did, <laughs> like this, and now filmmaking. That's um, awesome. We'll see how, how that one goes. You know, when I was thinking about it, I thought, okay, would it be the 52 films? Would it be my last feature? Greatest achievement for me is whatever film I made last because every film I'm making, whether it's a commercial or a short film or a feature, music video, I'm constantly trying to push myself. And I, I really think that whatever I did last, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. however small it seems, that's my greatest achievement. And I hope that's always true. So good. Good. That's, that's a good film. answer. Okay. Who are your favorite filmmakers? Okay. I said historically. And that's what I, that's what the point of the question. I said, Wells, Hitchcock, and Bergman. Cool. Um, Wells, because of what I explained before. Right. You know, uh, Hitchcock, because he was such a complete master of the miss and scene. He didn't miss anything. So you were talking about yeah. Hitchcock. When, when yeah. I, I was saying that Hitchcock is, was a complete master of the cinematic form. Right. Uh, he never looked behind the camera. It didn't matter. Uh, he knew how to shape a script to accommodate his view of that story. Yeah. And then he knew how to lead his actors into realizing it 100%. Mm -hmm. So he was the second. And then Bergman, because of what he achieved, um, he blended the theatrical form with the cinematic form. I think more closely than any other director in the history of film. Okay. Yeah, no. uh, he used monologues. Right. He used, um, you know, individual soliloquies. He used all sorts of forms to tell psychologically what was going on with the characters. He is one of the few directors, really, who is able to make films without a conventional plot, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense of something like Persona. Or even uh, something like Cries and Whispers. You know, it's not cause and effect sort of thing. It's really just investigation of what's going on in the psyche right. of the individuals. Yeah. And it is so difficult to achieve that and I love it. I mean, I could watch his films all the time. He's sort of out of favor these days. But I would encourage anyone who's interested in looking at um, really worthwhile films that don't try to just tell you a good story, but probes into the subterranean aspects of who we are. Right, they certainly do. You, you need to look at the mature works of Ingmar Bergman. Yeah. I, uh, my favorite filmmakers are Herzog, mm -hmm. Hawks, mm -hmm. I talked about both of them already, right. and Bresson. Okay, yes. Of Bresson, because I think that he, what I really feel confidently that maybe what he did and possibly, you know, Kubrick did with 2001, but what we're talking about Brisson, is the closest to pure cinema. And he was pushing mm -hmm. the medium towards 
completely divorcing it from theater and making something wholly original and pure. So mm. that's yes. what I, I like about him. I, I like him too. Mind. Yeah, I think he's... Uh, I mean, you've actually exposed me to him more than I was exposed to him before. Yeah. And um, I understand what you're saying because yeah. he is close to pure cinema. Well, that was a fun period when we started yes. watching that. And discovering and, you yes. know, Every week we're watching different films and talking about it and a lot of excitement about Cause it. Because I'd seen some of the films that I was baffled by them. Yeah. <laughs> That's really what yeah. it was. Yeah, I was like, totally what baffled. Because yeah. Yeah. I saw Lancelot the Luck originally, yeah. but I expected Knights of the Round Table. Right. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Who are your favorite writers? Okay, and that question is in there because... I really think filmmakers should have a sense of literature. Uh, and when, when I said writers, I, was, I didn't mean screenwriters. There are people, yes, who are terrific at screenwriting. But I think one of the problems we have with young filmmakers today, or aspiring filmmakers, is they don't know how to tell a story. They don't read enough. Uh, no, yeah. they just don't read enough. Uh, for me, I listed, um, I said the ones who have impressed and influenced me the most are Charles Bukowski, The Outlaw. <laughs> True Maverick. Yes. Margaret Duras. Okay. French filmmaker as well as writer. She's um, primarily a writer, but filmmaker as well, and completely daring in her thought process and right. even in her structural style. And then to go to the up extreme opposite end, W. Somerset Moore. Okay. Yes, you see, you're a British gentleman, you have a crazy French lady, and you have an American drunk. A scummy okay. American yes. drunk. Yes. So, there you cool. Are. I like that. Mine are, and I'll echo what you said, I, in the sense that I learned more in college in my literature classes mm -hmm. about filmmaking and storytelling than I learned in a single you know, in, in all of the film classes combined, I learned more in one wow. writing class, you know. Yeah. And that's where I discovered many of the writers, or one of the writers I have here, the first, John O'Hara. Mm -hmm. His uh, short stories totally informed uh, what I think is, is a good short film, but just storytelling in general. And I learned so much from reading his. So he's one of my favorite writers. Mm -hmm. Every time I read one of his shorts, I, I'm, you know, amazed at what he was able to create. Norman MacLean who didn't write a book until he was 50, 60, yes. something like that, and wrote A River Runs mm -hmm. Through It. And I've read that book many times, and every time I read it, I, I feel like those words were waiting 60 years to come <laughs> out, and there's not a single word on the page that shouldn't be there. You know, it's the most perfect text for me. And then the last would be just a favorite of mine is a writer named Alan First, who is dedicating himself to only writing about Europe between, I think, the 1933 and 1945 during the World War II period. They're, they're romantic spy novels. Someone mm -hmm. said it's like reading Casablanca. That's what it's like <laughs> to me. He's written like 12 books in there. And it, he kind of describes it in the sense of like the, you know, Hemingway talked about the big book of the sea. Well, this is, it's 14 big, books yes. that all or whatever, encompass this period of time. So those okay. are my favorites. What would you like the near future to hold for you? Again, I, I thought about it, and I thought more opportunities to make films that can challenge and provoke viewers in ways they haven't been before. Right. That's really was my answer. That's good. That. I like that. I would like to see our projects funded. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, see, that, well, you know what? The best part of this question, Q&A, is it tells anybody watching, and we have people, I mean, people do stop right. us and tell us they watch, the differences between you and I, right. both intellectually and practically. This is true, okay. yes. Uh -huh. So I would like to see our projects funded. It would liberate me. Oh, of course. So. Of course, yes. Okay. Okay, final one. What is your motto, Gus? I said, uh, my motto is try and break all the rules. And I qualify that by saying, because it is only by doing that, that anything great is ever achieved. I'm saying cinematically or right. in the arts or in life even. Um, I, th I was saying, you need to learn the rules, of course, because the rules have a reason for being there. But after you learn them, then you have to break them in some way because that's the only way you're going to be original. Right. I, uh, you know, I wanted to say that I relate to that personally in a certain way because someone, um, someone that I was working with recently said, basically, if our next project 
fails or mm-hmm. succeeds. It it tells us whether we've been going the right way with running wild mm-hmm. or the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And I said, no, mm-hmm. that's incorrect, right? Mm-hmm. You know, because basically they were referring to the fact that we've pissed people off because we want to do things differently, right? <laughs> you know, and I said, no, it, one project does not dictate that, you know, and, and every filmmaker I admire has seen highs and lows. Okay. Regardless, they stick with, with what they, they want to do. They follow their, their instincts, which is my motto, right? Mm-hmm. Follow right. your instincts. Right. And they break rules and, and they say, okay, I'm going to upset people. I'm going to turn people off. I'm going to lose, you know, support, but mm-hmm. I'm going to keep doing it. So my motto for filmmaking is follow my instincts and um, don't overthink things. Just, mm-hmm. you know, go with your gut. I want to make films from my gut yeah. is kind of how I think of it. And then uh, I was going to say personally, uh, something I like to live up to is a D.H. Lawrence poem. I never saw a wild thing feel, feel sorry for itself. A bird will fall frozen dead from a tree without ever having felt sorry for itself. And again, I, I mess that up all the time. I'm constantly, you know, screwing up and, and, and maybe, you know, having moments where I, I feel sorry for myself, where I sink into self-pity. And then I have to remind myself, you know, what? You know, you're, you're just an, an animal, right? And just keep doing this and, you know, and, and don't sit around, you know, feeling sorry for yourself. But it's human. It is yeah, human. It's human. Uh, there are times when you just feel, I feel it, you know. Right. The world is completely against me. Right. You know, and they don't understand my value. Right. You know? And a motto is something that you're not going to constantly live up to, but you're, you know, you're going you're gonna to want to right. reach right. for me. It reminds me of that wonderful moment in the movie Arthur. The original, yeah. when he says, you know, he, he falls, wallows in self-pity with um, Hobson. And he says, you know, I, I, I'm worthless. And um, Hobson makes him take his glasses off and he slaps him like three times, very lightly. And he says, so you feel unloved. Welcome to the world. Right. Everyone is unloved. And if it means anything, I love you. Okay? <laughs> it's done. That's good. <laughs> I like that. Was that was exactly it. So anyway, we're done with okay. our Proust we're done with uh, this. question is, as I said, I think the value of this is that uh, for the people looking, they see the difference between us because the answers uh, right. point out the right. difference across the board yeah, between us. I said I wanted to say something about Mike Nichols, who has just passed. This one, one yes, today we today, this morning. Um, it was a, a shock and a surprise. Um, we we're saying that we we're looking forward to, to his next he work, next, yes, yeah. because he always seemed perennially youthful. Even in the photograph they showed, he was 83 years old, but I would have guessed it, you know, looking at him. Yeah. And um, I was thinking of my favorite Mike Nichols films when I was looking at that, and they're not the films that everybody else likes. I, I thought The Graduate was all right. Um, Virginia Woolf I wasn't crazy about, really. My favorites were uh, Silkwood. I really love Silkwood. Uh, Biloxi Blues. Love that one. Uh, yeah, I love that. And Primary Colors. Mm-hmm. I really like... It's uh, a very primary, smart movie. Yes, yes yeah. very smart, very nicely done film. You know? And I think he's somebody that we're going to miss yeah. uh, as a filmmaker. Definitely. I what, agree. What were your Well, I was points? actually thinking this morning when I saw that, I want to write a uh, short blog. Okay, in memory, good, good. But not about his whole career, about one movie... I'm very affectionate for, and I know you're not, you don't care for it too much, is Working Girl. Mm-hmm. And I just want to write about the things I like in that movie, because he created a movie that I keep going back to, specifically for the moments with Harrison Ford and Melanie Griffith, mm-hmm. and I just really like it, and it just lingers with me. So That's good. It makes me That's smile. Yes, so he yes, created yes. a movie that will always make me smile. Mm-hmm. And he also directed on stage. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, going through the um, obituary, they were saying, you know, he won... Awards in every medium. He did he won, the, what is it? The there's some name for it, but Tony. Um, he won Emmy. the Tony, the Emmy. He won um, Oscar, the Academy Award. He also won a Grammy too. Right. Um, I forgot what the sound thing that he did, you know, record. But he won awards in every area. Crazy. And so um, that's a career that's well worth uh, looking at and considering. And oddly enough, you know, I looked at his number of films, and I was surprised there weren't as many as I thought there mm-hmm. were. Yeah, you know, because he seemed to perennially be with us. Right. And it was only 22 pictures he made. Yeah, you know, and I, thought, I would have sworn there was a bigger number. Right. Uh, he was selective, but um, he, he really always made the film, even when I didn't like it, interesting mm-hmm. in one way or another. 
Yeah. Okay. Do you know what we're talking about next time? Are we going to start tackling the? Yeah, we'll start tackling the um, the American. All right. Uh, so cinema. we're going to start tackling Andrew Saris's American cinema yes. and seeing if we can come up with the new updated American cinema. Yeah. At least in some of the categories. Right. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. We can't do all the categories together. We'll do a little each time. I think. Okay. You know, okay. Like that. A little bit more manageable. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So we are done. See you next time. Okay. <laughs>